What is up, my martial arts fanatics? Welcome back to System Breakdowns. Uh, this month, I'm excited to be breaking down Dreykus Duplessis. Uh, he's somebody who's been heavily requested lately, and after his recent victory over Robert Whitaker, it's time. Uh, this is a guy who has had a really interesting fight style. I'm excited to break this down because I think that I have figured out a lot of stuff about his game that I think a lot of people who have done analysis are not getting. And so I, I kind of feel a little bit like, I know something you don't know. <laughs> so I do want to share this though because I think that this guy has such an interesting unique style and one of the things I like about it is that it is not a teachable style in some regards. This is a style that a fighter develops on his own through a lot of sparring and is cultivated by coaches to start giving a little bit of cleanliness to the style if that makes sense to really refine it. Uh, make his techniques a little bit more robust. And this has certainly been the case for Dreykus Duplessis, who started off um, in a fighting style that I, I would argue was a little bit on the, like, not reckless, but I don't want to call it sloppy, but it, it's a very wild style. I think that's a good way of describing it. Sort of like what you see out of a guy like Michael Chandler. It's very effective because it's explosive, but it's also very wild. And what has really happened over the last couple fights is a tremendous amount of refinement. And he, you know what? A lot of people did not think he could beat Robert Whitaker. I have to say, I was not totally shocked when I saw that he was able to knock him out in the second round. And part of that comes from the fact that he's had some really nice victories over some pretty good guys like Darren Till, Derek Brunson. Like, these are not pushovers by any means. Uh, but Robert Whitaker is a really big feather in his cap for sure because that guy, um, I mean, like everybody's saying, like aside from Izzy, He's kind of like Max Holloway. In a world without Izzy, he is an undisputed champ. Just like Max Holloway in a world without Volkanovski is undisputed champ. Um, but the fact that he was able to beat Robert Whitaker the way that he did really shows that his coaches uh, have been doing a very, very good job of slowly cleaning up his style. So we're going to talk about today what it is that he does that makes him so successful uh, and how he plays to these strengths. As always, we're talking about systems, not technique selection and stuff like that. So we're going to break down Dreykus Duplessis, a.k.a. Still Knox from South Africa, who has a tremendous fighting history. Uh, his K1 fights, he's got a ton of knockouts in there. His UFC record, I mean, this guy is a finisher, and I really enjoy that aspect of him. So we're going to break him down today, so stay tuned. Let's get to it. Okay, let's talk about the evolution of Dreykus Duplessis. First of all, to understand how he's evolved, you kind of have to understand what his game plan is. What this guy does is so unique, and I've never really seen a fighter exemplify this before. What he does is he creates an exhaustion in the fight. He likes to do a lot, particularly in the first round, to get both of them really, really tired. Um, he creates a lot of scrambles, does a lot of high-paced stuff, does a lot of explosive attacks where he throws everything into it. And what he's trying to do is create an exhaustion. And he does this through a lot of range management to keep himself safe. But then he starts creating traps within that exhaustion. And what he really excels at is being more disciplined in exhaustion than his opponent. And this is a really interesting concept to play with of being so comfortable in exhaustion that you are the one who is more capable in those moments. And this is something that he does very, very well. And he uses a lot of in and out technique to create explosion and really maximize his ability to strike them without being struck back. And a lot of luring as he backs up to pull them into his counters, which are very devastating. And he throws a lot of power in every technique, 100% power every time he throws, so that he has a high percentage of every time he throws of getting a finish. But the added benefit is that he gets to create more of that exhaustion and then in the second and third round, when both fighters are very tired, this is when he is extremely dangerous. He actually slows himself down, becomes more refined in the way that he attacks, picks his moments better because he doesn't want to waste energy, keeps his hands up, and is very disciplined when his fighters start, his opponents start doing things like dropping their hands. That's what happened to Derek Brunson. First round, Derek Brunson's winning, like really does a great job against them. But as the fight progresses on and he gets more tired, he wrestles a bunch and creates a lot of scrambles. He does a lot of explosive striking. And what happens is in the future rounds, 
in the second round in particular, you start to see this huge shift as both fighters come into the second round tired. And while he, uh, Dreykus Duplass C, DDP, is staying disciplined, his opponent starts getting sloppy. They start getting wild to match his wildness, that explosive attack. But he is more precise. He waits till they explode in on him, and he catches them cleaner. He does a high shell and then a return fire, kind of like what you see out of guys like RDA. Very disciplined in his approach. He absorbs any counters. And in addition to that, because he backs up a lot as guys are attacking him, the principle of reduced force is at play, where essentially he rolls with techniques a lot. Uh, the way I always like to explain it is, if I hold a kicking pad or a target pad here and you punch it straight, you do a lot of damage. Now as I pull this away as you punch, the best you can hope for is a glance. And he does a lot of this where he absorbs at a glance and then returns fire. And when he returns fire, he throws his whole body into it to use the principle of doubled force to catch them as they're moving in. This is the flip side of that force equation where if you can catch a guy as they're moving forward and you meet their force with your force and put your whole body behind it, man, what a devastating attack. In the case of Robert Whitaker, we see this cleaned up through using a jab, very similar to what you see out of guys like uh, Anderson Silva used to do this, this knockout with a jab, and it was using the principle of doubled force as they come in, and as you're coming forward, you meet that force, and he does it in a very clean way, shoulder down, head down, on the inside, and this is how he starts catching Robert Whitaker. And so, it's an interesting shift as time goes on. So let's break this down in a little bit more detail to explain uh, kind of the mechanics of how he works. Now, what's interesting about him is that he uh, comes out most of his fights orthodox, but he does also switch stance. He's been known to go to southpaw for a while, and I think he feels more comfortable in southpaw, and that is actually his default. I think the orthodox is what his boxing coaches have taught him to do, because you know, when you're a right-handed fighter, you put that right hand behind you. But he does seem to prefer this, particularly to implement a lot of his wrestling game, to put himself right foot forward. And what I find interesting is that he kind of does what you see out of some high-level kickers, where when they start kicking, like Yair Rodriguez does this, he goes right foot forward a lot when he wants to start kicking because he wants to start hitting that liver and stuff like that. But then he goes left foot forward when he wants to do a lot of hand striking. Dreykus 2 plus C kind of does this same principle where he stays left foot forward a lot, he might attack some leg kicks and stuff like that and start to stance switch and then move back and stuff like that because he does stance switch a lot in his retreats. But you'll see him get more comfortable switching to the right foot forward in the southpaw where you start to see him want to implement more of a wrestling game. And this is because a lot of wrestlers like to lead off that right foot for their shot. It feels more comfortable to use that as their guide foot. So that is a thing that you'll certainly see him do. His style of striking is mostly boxing. He will throw some kicks, particularly that lead leg roundhouse, which I find interesting. It's a nice technique because remember, he's going to be on the outside and he wants to do this expanding, contracting concept. This is very point style, actually, what I find interesting. And he's going to get on the outside and he's going to throw a kick. Most of his fights, he likes to start his fights with leg kicks in particular. He throws a lot of the lead side leg kick at the start of his fights. Why? Because this is a good range finder and you can start to kind of pick at them a little bit and play the, um, use the principle of opportunism to strike from the outside where they can't really catch you with a whole lot. And you can start kind of landing some shots, but he's also using this to lure them back. So as he comes out here, he likes to throw this front side leg kick. He'll throw it midsection, he'll throw it to the leg, um, but he's throwing a lead side roundhouse kick and then backing up. Why? Because he gets to land a little bit, gets to figure out his range, and like I said, he gets to start luring them in. From here, what commonly happens is, it's the tendency of a lot of fighters, everybody gets taught in MMA, you gotta back guys up, you never retreat. Always back them up, never retreat. Well, what you're seeing is that there's some really high level strikers who that is not true for. Guys like Sugar Sean are really good at playing the retreat game with a lot of front kicks and stuff like that. With Dreykus C, what he does is he draws back using the principle of reduced force so that if they do catch him, they're not doing a lot of damage. But he covers up high and he'll use his high shell to absorb a lot of stuff. So not only is he blocking, but he's reducing the force. And then what's happening is as they're continuing to move forward, 
after they strike because remember to reach him he's backing up a lot so they've got to be pretty committed to their attacks to get to him and this is what happens a lot of times guys start using a blitz style strategy to attack him they put a lot of pressure on him and then they start committing to their attacks particularly because when you see a guy backing up in mma what frequently happens is you feel like you're winning you feel like you've got this guy on the ropes and he's running away from you now's the time to go for blood right wrong and this is what Dreykus Duplass he preys on. He starts to back up, absorbing it. And as they continue to move forward, he starts catching them with inside punching that lands devastatingly. This is a very nice strategy to hit guys with a counter game. What's interesting is that Robert Whitaker does something very similar in his game where he does a lot of retreating with the low hands and throwing counters back. Uh, that's something that he developed in the second half of his career. We'll talk about that later. Uh, breakdown of Robert Whitaker. I highly recommend you go back and watch that. So DDP likes to pull them back, reduce the impact, absorb, and as they're moving in, throw these heavy counters. Now, then when he starts wanting to hit them, if guys start aren't taking the bait, well, now it's time for him to attack. And he uses a couple strategies that are really interesting. Now, early on in his career, this is why I said he started off a little bit wild, very similar to like a Michael Chandler where he does explosive blitz style punching. And this is something that he started doing in K1 and in his early MMA career before he got to the UFC, where he could afford to be a little bit reckless. And what's interesting is that he's like, I'm willing to risk maybe catching a shot to land heavy on this guy. And so he would come in here doing this stuff. But early on, you see a lot of head up type stuff, throwing these punches, just trying to land something. What's happened over time is you started to see a shift in tactics a little bit. Um, it started off by reducing the amount that he chases them and not throwing so many big punches at once, throwing just one attack at a time. And in the case of Robert Whitaker, what you see is a real refinement of this, where now he starts switching to southpaw and he goes to the outside. And when he blitzes in, he uses what I refer to as the lunging jab. This is something that Trevor Whitman teaches. We talk about that in the Kamara Usman breakdown, where your back foot slides up and then you push off. This is something I teach a lot in the Nemean fight system. It's one of the three styles of jab that I teach. And if you're an outside fighter, this is really the ideal one to use. Uh, usually when I teach it, I'll do a lot of top hand position to really get them thinking about this stuff. And I'll sneak this foot in so that they don't see it. So they, they feel like we're at the same range. And then from here... I start to blast forward off of this. And this is what Dreykus Duplassi does to Robert Whitaker. He goes from a southpaw stance, but what's interesting is now he's going to focus on getting an inside position so that as Whitaker throws, he's going to be inside of Whitaker's hand so that he's going to absorb anything Whitaker throws on his shoulder and he's going to get the clean shot. When he does so, you'll see that his head drops off and pulls away. He commits to the attack lunges in on the inside, protects his head with his shoulder, drops his head, and comes up. This is very similar to what you used to see out of George St. Pierre with his jabbing, where he would throw this kind of sliding jab and drop his head as he did it. This is very similar to that kind of concept. And, you know, he does still throw some blitz attacks in here. He throws the outside kicking and stuff like that. But I think where he gets the most benefit out of this is the way that we see him attack with Robert Whitaker. Now, what's interesting about this is then he starts playing a level change game. He gets guys used to this in and out flow. He attacks them with the blitz, or in the case of Robert Whitaker, he does the lunging attacks. He does do some blitzing on Whitaker as well. And then he disengages, he separates, luring them in to attack him so that he can start to counter back. In a lot of his earlier fights, you see things like collar ties being the start to be implemented. As he comes in to attack, or as guys start coming at him, he starts catching a collar tie, throwing some uppercuts and stuff like that. Then he starts using this to get his double legs. Now, early on in his career, he would do a lot of clinching as an exit strategy, right? He throws these blitz punches, gets to a clinch, right? He might throw like a cross hook, gets to a clinch, a collar tie. And then the first time he does it, he throws some uppercuts. Then he backs out, you know, he does his counter. And then the next time he comes back in, he attacks with a blitz again. He disconnects. Then he comes in early on his career. He'd go for the collar tie and then go for the double leg. But later on, he starts to improve even on this where he comes out, punches, defends and counters. 
separates, backing up, blitzing in, defending counter, ebb and flow, right? Then as he comes in and they're starting to think about this, he starts to faint high and drop down to his double legs. This is why his double legs come from nowhere. These guys are convinced he's coming forward. And what is a natural response? To back up. So while he's coming forward with his blitz and they're backing up, he faints, he level changes, hits his double leg, straight down to the mat. Very effective strategy. Now, when guys try to take him down, he's pretty good about doing a lot of standard thing, getting his underhooks and stuff like that. But what's great about him is that when he goes to the ground, this only helps him. From here, he's gonna create a lot of scrambles. This is kind of the basis of his game. He's not a kind of like hang out and play the ground game. He's a very active guy on the ground, both offensively and defensively. Uh, we'll talk about some specifics of that in the next section, but what he's gonna do is try to make them work. He's gonna make them work and make them work and make them work. And when he gets to the feet, he's tired but so are they. And between this and this aggressive pace, guys get very tired very quickly against them. Partially because when you're chasing somebody and they start throwing back, that's a very aggressive pace. He makes them run around the ring a lot. And when he throws, he throws heavy every single time. He doesn't need to land every time. It's okay if he misses. When he blitzes, you know, this is kind of like what Michael Chandler does. Okay, he misses, he might miss on three of them, but the one he connects on, you're going to see some damage. And especially when you talk about the principle of double force being at play. Whew, man, this guy packs a wallop. So he reduces the force on theirs, throws big, heavy. But like I said, what is his goal? First round, get everybody tired. The second round, what you'll notice is that this kind of like wild pace that he does, he starts to slow down a little bit. This is actually, I think, his naturally perfect pace into the second and third round when he himself stops exploding in and out as much and he starts to he's still moving back and making him do stuff he's still coming out but he's a little bit cleaner now and a little bit more patient he still throws everything to every punch but the pacing is a little bit more in tune with what you would normally want to see out of a fighter but the difference is now he's starting the second round where he's coming in at the right pace but his opponents are not they're tired their hands start dropping and they start getting clipped. They start being sloppy in their attacks because they're like, hey, I've had this guy on the ropes in the first round. I wanna come back out here and finish this fight, right? That is a common thing you see happen um, where the second round, guys are still trying to increase that pace. And he's like, no, 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 we're not doing that pace now. Now you're gonna come in and I'm gonna catch you, right? Bah, bah. And as you come in, he's gonna land heavy because you're throwing wild. You're not as clean as you were the first round because the first round, you know, when everybody comes out and they're fresh, everybody's super disciplined, right? Throwing correctly and all that stuff, keeping the built-in defenses in place. But now as the second round comes up, they start dropping the built-in defenses, right? When they throw across, you start seeing hands dropping, heads getting high, shoulders not protect, right? All these built-in defenses that are supposed to be in play are not perfect. And this is what he exploits. And he starts putting his whole body behind techniques and landing heavy as they come out in an undisciplined fashion in the second round. Now he's tired too, but he's used to that. He's more disciplined from there. So he keeps his hands up. In the second round when they're coming out, he'll eat this high, eat stuff on his high shell as he moves back, making them spend energy, trying to hit him, only to connect with glancing blows at best. And as they continue to get tired, he's so good at finding that perfect opening as they come in, pop! and catching them cleanly as they do this. Um, one thing I find interesting in the Robert Whitaker fight that I also wanna give uh, attention to, we talked about getting in and out, doing like the collar ties, or in and out and shooting. In the Robert Whitaker, he goes in and out, and he starts doing something that is very similar to what like Leoto Machida used to do, where he would throw his attacks and tie up, okay? Well, Machida used to do this thing where like, he would attack, and do what I call the schoolboy defense, where he'd be in here and then get to overhooks. Uh, Dreykus Duplessis does something very similar in the Robert Whitaker fight. He attacks and he gets to this over wrap clinch, is what I call it, where you're underhooking here, the other arm comes around, 
and he ties up here, and it's very similar to what you see like a judo headlock thing, the way that he applies it, which is a slightly different take than what I've seen in the past, but it works great. And he does it as Sotagari out of reaping, and brings Robert Whitaker down with a beautiful technique. I think that's a nice addition to what he does, adding that clinch, so that not only is he cleaner in his attacks, as he starts coming in here with this lunging jab to play on that in and out, catching the inside, but now he starts throwing, getting to a clinch as a exit strategy. Getting this over wrap clinch is great for him. He's got a great underhook control, really keeps them tight and uses this to bring them down. And what's cool about this is um, he already has a, an affinity for things like lat drops and stuff like that anyway. But if he does get broken backwards, it's okay. His bottom game is going to work well for what he does. We're going to talk about jujitsu in a bit. But what's cool is that if he gets brought to the bottom, what does that do for him, especially in the first round? Once again, it goes back to his idea of create scrambles on the ground. Create a little bit of space, create a scramble, make them work. Constantly moving the first round, keeping, expending a lot of energy to try to control. And then as he gets back up, now he's continuing to tire them out. And it's a brilliant strategy. It's something um, I, I don't think I've ever seen. The closest I've seen is guys who do what I call fake exhaustion as a psychological thing, like Derek Lewis who would get hit, and then he kind of fold over and stuff like that, and then he throws heavy as they come in, um, or gets exhausted. But his exhaustion is real. He's just making them tired, maybe even more tired, but then being more disciplined in that exhaustion. And that is a really interesting strategy. Okay, guys, so let's finish up on the ground here. Um, there's a lot to say, but I don't want to spend too much time here. There, there's a couple key points I want to talk about. One is that his goal is to create a lot of scrambles from here. And what I find interesting is that his game is kind of polar opposite of mine. My game, uh, because I'm a little bit older, I roll with a lot of younger guys. I have to be able to roll for several rolls after this and continue that pace. I can't do that kind of explosiveness that he has. Uh, I, can't, I just can't match with these other guys. So my game is very much about pulling them in, slowing them down in the match, getting as much contact of my body against their body to really isolate um, and restrict their movements. That's why I play a lot of lockdown. His game's the opposite. His game is about explosive movements, creating as much separation of the bodies as possible, and using that to um, create scrambles and reverse positions, anticipate where they're gonna go, and then either get to his feet or reverse position. Um, very, very interesting tactic, because remember, his goal is to tire them out on the ground. He loves the ground because as soon as you get him down there, Man, he's going to make you work from there. He's going to tire you up. I'll give you a good example. Derek Brunson takes him down into side control. And there's this commentary that takes place during there that I don't agree with because I understand where his game is going a little bit more. And so he does this movement when Brunson gets on side control, pushes the arm across, creates a bunch of space. Brunson starts to circle around, get his hips up, get his feet wide, and then comes back into him. He gets a half guard out of this. He doesn't get the full escape. That's not uncommon. Uh, when you're doing a side control escape to not necessarily get back to your feet, but just to get to a half guard. But the commentary was that, oh, look how much energy he expended. But yeah, look how much Brunson had to expend too. He's got to hold this guy down. He's getting pushed off. He's got to circle around, re-engage, and hold him down. So now he's in a half guard, and he starts using this to create some frames, get to his knees, and start to work back in for a single leg. Once again, creating space and trying to explode up. Brunson goes for a guillotine, but loses it. Now, I want to talk about something that he does that I really like. I've actually started implementing this in my own game. It's, I think, a better solution for a lot of guillotine stuff than anything I've ever seen before. Um, generally speaking, when you're in the headlock position, the front headlock, you tend to be very parallel with them. And what happens is these guys start sinking that elbow in. And even if you're controlling the hands, this is kind of weak. And I've been doing a lot of different stuff over the years. I play with elbow dragging them across to escape out so that, you know, as I'm in here, start to elbow drag and circle out. Uh, you know, I, I cross to the other side of the body if they start to pull a guillotine and sit with it and stuff like that. But uh, it's still a very tough position when you have a good guillotine guy. And what he does kind of negates both guillotines and darses exceptionally well. And it's so stupidly simple, like a lot of jujitsu, that you're like, how did this not occur to me before? He just makes his body perpendicular. Very simple. It's, it's like, why did I not occur to me to focus on this? He's parallel here. He gets his hands on here, and he just starts shifting his butt around to make himself perpendicular. They're going to follow. They're going to try to follow. No problem. I just come in here, and I continue to work and shift around. I can even stand up as I do it and start to shift around because they're going to have a tough time sinking in anything from him. 
as they do so, as I get perpendicular, I'm gonna start to work on these hands and start to expend them out. Eventually, when they realize they can't get anything, I open them up and I can either stand up or move on to my reversal um, single leg, whatever. What's nice about this is that when they go perpendicular with you, if you're the guy on top, as they start to turn here, and I have my guillotine and I wanna punch it through here, my elbow starts getting flared out, right? As I come around, they're just gonna follow me, so I can't really control from there. My underside here, I can't punch a Dars because he's controlling the wrist, being proactive, going, okay, I've already got this. I'm not gonna like you, let you get this. If you try to open up your hands, the minute you do so, I'm gonna create space. So as they get here, if I try to swim my hand through or punch it through, even if both hands are connected, I'm stuck here, right? My hands are not shifting in either direction. My elbow's getting flared out. I can't jump on the back from here. This elbow's preventing it. I gotta open up if I wanna do anything. And as soon as they do, you're free. It's brilliant. It's so stupidly simple. Um, and it works really, really well. Kind of a game changer for me. Uh, I was playing with that last night. And you ended up in that position a couple times. Worked out it with ease. Got to here, perpendicular, hold the hands, open them up. So stupid. Um, but like I said, the case of the Derek Brunson fight, uh, I think he kind of gets to here. Brunson's trying to jump on the neck, he loses it. DDP creates all this space and starts to create new scrambles. Uh, he does other examples of this too, where he kind of anticipates where they're gonna go. In the Tavares fight, I think it was, he gets side controlled again. And when he tries to go to mount, he gets his foot on the inside, butterfly hooks, kicks them off. Remember, once again, creating space uses that to create scrambles. If you happen to get him in a closed guard, he's just gonna back up his hips, you know, start to stand up, stuff like that, making you expend a lot of energy to keep him there. All of this stuff on the ground is about making you work to keep him down. Then he's gonna try to reverse. If he does happen to get it back up, he's really good against the cage, getting his other hooks in reversing position. When he's up against the cage, he'll frequently drop for double legs and stuff like that. It's kind of his go-to is to go for the double leg. Uh, on the top, he's got a great top game. There until he gets a nice, uh, he gets that body triangle, jumps on the back and starts threatening here, punch, 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 go for a choke, that kind of stuff. Um, when he takes guys down, he frequently do body lock style passing. He gets a hold of the hips, really sinks that in, starts to get his feet over and starts doing stuff to start creating punching to force a turn away and then jumping on the back. Um, very, very effective system, but man, he's beaten up some legitimate like jujitsu black belts and stuff like that by putting their hips against the cage, you know, this kind of stuff. Uh, really, really an effective strategy. So that's pretty much what you're gonna say about the jujitsu game. I don't wanna go into too many specifics because this video will take two hours, but that's kind of the general idea of, once again, creating scrambles and anticipating where they're gonna go, using against them because you know they're gonna drive back in, and doing things like uh, creating frames, getting butt out, stuff like that, so that you can kind of beat them to wherever they're gonna go, so that you don't give them an opportunity to come back on top. And then you get to be uh, in control of that scramble. Um, but also to make them work to keep you down. So that's a big part of this jujitsu game. So really interesting stuff.